Hi, I'm Professor David Adley. In this video, I'll be using the Seasons and Ecliptic Simulator from Nap Labs to show the relationship between the location of an observer on the Earth, the Earth's location in its orbit, and the seasons, or lack thereof, experienced by that observer. Let's get started. I've got Nap Labs open, and I'll begin by going to Basic Coordinates and Seasons. And then I'll open up the Seasons and Ecliptic Simulator. Now that the simulator is open, let me do some initial configuration. I'm going to drag my observer, represented by the little stick person here, up until the observer is at about my latitude. So that's, that's about right. Somewhere around in there is the latitude of my home in Denver, Colorado. And now I'll choose a starting point for my year, which I'm going to make June 21st. If you're familiar with seasons and solstices and equinoxes, then you might know that June 21st is around the time of the summer solstice and the beginning of summer in the Northern Hemisphere. Before I start the Earth moving in its orbit, first let me point out something important. If you look at this lower right-hand panel, this is showing you the approximate angle of sunlight with the ground at local noon, so when the sun is at its highest point in the sky. And you'll notice that those rays from the sun are coming almost straight down, because if I come and look at my earth window up here with my little stick friend in it, you'll notice that the sun is at the Tropic of Cancer at 23 and a half degrees north latitude, and therefore sunlight coming from the direction of the sun way off over there to the right is almost directly overhead for me. This is one important factor in seeing the seasons located on earth. The other important factor is to look at the amount of daylight that I get. This red line that's highlighted marks the latitude of the observer. And you'll notice that at this location, the red line is somewhere between two-thirds and three-quarters in daylight and only about one-third in darkness. So what that implies is that in a 24-hour day, approximately two-thirds of that, or 16 hours, the sun will be in the sky, and then the other one-third, for eight hours, the sun will be below the horizon and it will be dark outside. What you should notice as the Earth starts to move is that both of those factors that I pointed out to you, the steep angle of sunlight and the large fraction of the red line covered in daylight, are going to change as the Earth makes its way along its orbit. We've now completed one quarter of a full orbit. We've gone from June 21st to September 21st, and we're now at what's called the autumnal equinox, the first day of autumn. And you'll notice in my Earth simulator that everywhere on Earth has half daylight and half darkness for that observer. So I can drag my observer down to the equator or down to the Tropic of Capricorn or even all the way down to the Antarctic Circle. And everywhere that I can put my observer, there's going to be half daylight and half darkness. And as a result, day and night on this date will both be exactly 12 hours long. Okay, so let's take my observer back to my original location. Uh, about there-ish, that's about right and let the Earth continue on its way. As the Sun continues to move south, so it has crossed the equator, it's now south of the equator down here, you'll see that the Sun's rays are coming in at a very shallow angle relative to the ground. And by the time I reach late December, around the time of the winter solstice, now the Sun's rays are coming in at a very glancing angle. As a result, there's a lot of space in between these arrows, the 
tips of the sun's rays. And so the sun's light gets spread out more and it doesn't do as good a job heating the ground or the air or us as it does in June. So keep an eye on the spacing between the tips of these arrows as we move back towards summertime again. And you'll notice that as the angle of those rays gets steeper and steeper and steeper, the space between the rays is going to shrink. That's why when you stand in the summer sun, it can feel like the sun is absolutely beating down on you. And you can feel yourself getting really warm and possibly worried that you might get sunburn or skin cancer. Whereas in the wintertime, you can stand in the sun and you'll feel a little bit warmer than if you're standing in the shade, but the effect is much less pronounced. Okay, let's carry on. Let's get out of wintertime. As we leave December and move in through January, you'll see the sun once again moving back north again. It has passed its southernmost excursion on that summer solstice. It's going back north. It's getting ready to cross the equator. Okay, so it's crossed the equator. We've gone through that vernal equinox, the beginning of spring, and we're now moving back towards summer. And as I promised, you'll see that these arrowheads are indeed getting much more closely spaced together and as a result, someone standing under that light will feel a much more intense heating here in mid to late June than they did six months earlier in mid to late January. This demonstrates the importance of the Earth's position in its orbit for seasons for us here in the Northern Hemisphere. But lots of people live in the Southern Hemisphere. So let's drag our observer down to the south. We'll put them at about the latitude of, say, Argentina. I know Argentina is hidden. Um, it's a, it can go a little bit further south than South Africa. Um, you'll have to trust me. Argentina will show up eventually. But on this date, June 24th, well, let me just back up. We'll go to the 21st. So on the date of the solstice, which marks the beginning of northern summer, the conditions which set up summer in the Northern Hemisphere are flipped in the Southern Hemisphere. So whereas in the North, these sunlight rays are pointing almost straight down and they're very closely packed, now, once again, they're coming in at a glancing angle and they're pretty spread out. And whereas up here in the North, we get long time of daylight and only a short amount of darkness, the opposite is true in the south. There's a short amount of daylight and a long amount of darkness. And as a consequence, when we experience summer here in the northern hemisphere, our neighbors in the southern hemisphere are experiencing winter. What about at the equator? You'll notice that at the equator, even here at the summer solstice, when the conditions in the northern and southern hemispheres have reached an extreme, so they have very long days and very short nights in the north, for example, there are still exactly 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of darkness at the equator. That's going to be true year-round, and so we eliminate one of those factors that creates hot summers, and cold winters. At the same time, you can see that those rays from the sun are pretty straight up and down at the beginning of this next segment um, that we saw. And then they get very straight up and down when the sun crosses the equator. And now, even here, as we get towards the beginning of northern winter, the sun's rays, while tilted, are still more or less vertical. So the tips of those sunlight rays, those arrows, are still pretty closely packed. So someone living at the equator is going to get pretty intense heating from the sunlight, regardless of what time of year it is. It can change a little bit, but not nearly as much as the dramatic variations that we experience here in the north, or that people who live in the southern hemisphere would also experience. And that's why the seasons, if you live within the tropics, so close to the equator, are much less pronounced. Uh, you don't get a big change in the heat that you get from the sun 
over the course of a year, and therefore the seasons in the tropics are much more closely driven by local um, geographic conditions, things like ocean currents, wind, uh, like trade winds, things like that. Thanks for watching this video. I hope that you've learned a little bit about how seasons can depend on the location of an observer and how they relate to the amount of light that's coming in from the sun. As I let things uh, play out, I'll show you how light changes for someone, someone in the Southern Hemisphere, and I'll thank you for watching. I hope to see you again soon for another demonstration in astronomy. Bye for now.